Welcome to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. We are going to continue in the book of Romans, and we will be beginning in chapter 6 this evening. And so before we begin, I would like to offer a brief word of prayer to our Lord. Let's bow our heads. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? This is another one of those questions that the Apostle Paul has a way of asking when he's writing a letter to people to whom he's never seen before, never talked with it face to face, but he's assuming there may be some that will ask this question. And uh, I am under the, under the understanding that he has met many people who has already asked him this question. After he has preached the gospel, this question has popped up here and there. As a matter of fact, I've had this question asked to me many times. One in particular, you know my favorite colleague in the, in the chicken cutting business. When I was way young, I was cutting chicken. And uh, uh, I was a student in a Bible college at this time, and, and this other cutting, chicken cutter was a full-time pastor in a Pentecostal church. And he would say simply this, Russ, if I believed what you believe, I would get saved and live like the devil. And that would be the beginning of our next doctrinal discussion. Now, the question is very similar, not exactly the same. But this is one of those questions that sounds a little bit like, do you still beat your wife? It's one of those leading questions that have to do with the idea that if we do what you suggest, then this is what we will do. This is, this, it's very obvious. Sinners will not be encouraged to stop sinning if you tell them there is no way that you can be separated from the love of God and that our salvation is based wholly upon what He did and not what we do. Well, you'll just encourage sinners to keep sinning. And of course, the idea behind the question is this. We should surely preach something that get people to stop sinning. That should be the gospel. And to me, it's like, well, then you'll have to give it a new name because that's not really that good of news. You know, but, but the news doesn't mean we have free tickets to sin and still go to heaven. This is not what the gospel is. The gospel is, is that Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sin. And anyone that poses the question, well, that sounds like something that I would do and keep sinning. That doesn't sound like they're being saved from their sin. Of course, to this point, we're only talking about the guilt of sin, are we not? And uh, many people, that's all they're concerned about, the guilt of sin. And Paul has not addressed in this letter yet the power of sin in a person's life the power of sin that has to do with what we would call the sinful nature. Now, last week we ended chapter 5, and some people seem to think that chapter 5 ends the discussion on justification by faith. As a matter of fact, people would look at the book of Romans and usually say, Romans can be divided into four different sections. Chapters 1 through 5 deal with justification, and chapters 6 through 8 deals with sanctification and chapters 9, 10, and 11, that deals with the question of the Jews, and chapters 12 through 16, well, this is the practical application. Well, I don't believe that the Apostle Paul leaves the discussion of justification just like that, especially when he comes up with a question like this. What then shall we say then? Okay, now that implies something. He says, in light of what I just said, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, this is a transitional statement that says, I'm going to keep on talking about what I have just said. This is not a brand new point of discussion. Because if you recall, the original text did not have chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and the verses all the way through. These were added later on. And so there is nothing here that implies now the next chapter, or now we're going to start something different. No, we're talking about justification. We're talking about how God has imputed His righteousness that has been revealed 
from heaven to us and the method of imputation and how God has done this. And he has shown us this by showing us how we were in Adam. We had this union with Adam. And now we're going to talk about, you know, it's called transfer of knowledge. Once you understand one thing, then you can transfer that knowledge to another thing. As we were in Adam, so are we in Christ. And if we were dead in Adam, we will be alive in Christ. So when you think of these words, do not think that Paul wants us to die to sin. Now, it's not as though Paul is not trying to tell us we need to leave our sin. The gospel is repent and believe. And there are plenty passages that teach that, repentance, but this is not one of them. This is not one of the scriptures that says, you need to leave your sin. And you're saying, wait a minute, I've, that doesn't sound like that. It sounds to me, because as we go on, we're going to read the scriptures a little bit in this chapter that says, uh, you're dead to sin. And we're, saying, we're thinking to ourselves, I should die to sin. I should die to my sin. That's a good thing. But you see, that's not what he's asking you to do. He wants you to understand the fact that you were in Christ and Christ died. And when he died, you died. It has to do with this union with Christ, and it works a little bit like this. If you have died to sin, why are you continuing in it? That's the question that he's countering. There's a counter question with this. Or the encouragement to, you should not live and obey the laws of a kingdom that you are not a citizen of. You are union with Christ. You need to live to God the way Christ lives to God. And, and, and that's, it'll become clear as we go to these questions, but I'm not going to leave this question just quite yet. It's, a, it's not a fundamental new, que, no, new section, so that's what I want you to, to understand. We're still, I want you to still think about justification and being in Adam. And, we're, and I'm going gonna to give you a preview. When you think of being in Adam, I want you to think of the old man. Not, I mean, not your dad. You know, not your old man. The old man is Adam. And so if Adam is the old man, who is the new man? Christ. Many times we seem to think that we're the new man. We're, you know, we, we're, we've been made new. I'm a new man. And I have an old man, which is my old nature. I don't want you to think that. There are other passages of Scripture that teach that we have a sinful nature, that we need to mortify our sinful nature, and we need to suppress the sin in our life. But when we think of justification and the doctrine that Paul is teaching us, we must always remember that He's speaking of justification and Adam and Christ and the union that we had with Adam is like the union we have in Christ. And so when I use the words in Adam, in Christ, I want you to think we died in Adam. We also are made alive in Christ. And so these terms relate to our union with Christ, how we are in union in him, the blessings we have in Christ. It's because of that relationship. So, think like that. If I, if I think that you're not thinking that, <laughs> I, I know I, cannot, I can't tell what you're thinking, but some of you, I can tell a little bit like, you know, I, I don't know if you're hungry or if you don't understand, okay? But <clears throat> believe me, you think my face is expressive, you should be up here, <laughs> okay? Now, what, I'm going to back up. Two more verses. Remember last week I told you I was going to cover those verses again? Because this is the reason why he asked the question, what shall we say then? So, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, see, that's why he asked the question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, the idea here is that the Jew... And many of the people that will be believing the, uh, the gospel when Paul is preaching, and even in Rome, and many of the churches he preached in, were Jews, and also Gentiles that had been friends of Jews and understood the law that was given to Moses. And Paul has already said in the first three chapters 
how the law was given and sin revived and, and that the idea that the knowledge of sin was made clear and people became, shall we say, more aware and deeply keen and understanding that they are guilty before God because the written word, the written law has a way of saying, you have transgressed. It says right here, you have transgressed and it's logged down in the books that he's already addressed that issue, that when the law has been revealed, the transgression is recorded, okay? And the idea that if it's not recorded, if it was not written down, the word imputed, which is not the same as having righteousness imputed or sin imputed, the idea that the law was revealed and the written law helped you and opened your understanding to what is right and wrong, then you transgressed that law. And Adam transgressed that law because he was told, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was that type of law. Now, we can see that even when the law was given and the sin abounded, that the grace that is in Christ much more abounded. And the idea there, of course, is that when we were in Adam, death abounded how far? Well, only to everyone. The entire human race, all of Adam, died. And so you can see how the words are accurate. Sin abounded. It, it went to everyone because of the transgression of Adam. However, in Christ, the grace did much more abound. Now, the first thing that happens in the mind of someone who does not naturally and that's almost, well, I'm going to say, almost, I'm going to say almost everyone because there was one. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ did not naturally think this. He was in our flesh, but he was holy. But everyone else, all that was, are in Adam, think this. Why can't my goodness be looked at? Am I chopped liver? Do all my goodnesses and all the things that I do that are right don't they count for anything? Why does all my righteousness, why do they get to be only counted as filthy rags? Why do I have to give up everything that is good about me? The idea of self-righteousness is a very natural thing about sinners. They'll say, yes, yes, I know I'm not perfect, okay? And they always like to use that word perfect as though those that think they are, and of course that's not me, it's the Pharisee, that type of person that wants to make others think that they're better. And I'm not like that, but I do have some things. And they demand that respect. And, the first, and whenever they hear the gospel truly preached, this question pops up in the back of their head and usually makes its way to their mouth and says, now wait a minute. If there is no way that my goodness can count and you're saying that all of his righteousness is given to me and there is no way that I can be separated from the love of God, well then, what's to keep me from just living in sin so that the grace that abounds may much more abound on top of that, of this other sin. It would make God even look better if I was even more evil, wouldn't that? And of course, that is not an honest question. That is an antagonistic question. That is one of the questions like, well, so do you still beat your wife? There is no right answer to that, and there is no right answer to this other than, God forbid. That shouldn't even come up. That's the, but the thing about it is, is that Paul must have heard this question over and over again. The way I heard it was, if I believed what you believe, I would, and I always, I always have to say it like this, get saved. It, that, that type of phrase it was, it was very popular when I was a young man. People would get saved. You know, they would like, you know, get gas and get bread and get saved. And, you know, it's something that, you know, it's something you just get. Huh. <sighs> And it bothers me. You, you can tell it bothers me. You can tell me that. Uh, you can tell that even the phrase is, is irritating to me, because the freeness of God's grace and what God has done to save us is not something that we are able to 
wrestle out of God's hand as though we needed to, nothing that we have to be work so hard at. All we have to do is understand the gospel and believe it. Now, some people say, but what about repentance? <laughs> repentance from sin is part of this gift. It, it is. It's like, it's like when the eyes of the blind are open and you say, now, now you have to see, you know, you have to see, you're, you're telling a man who's just has his eyes healed and you have to tell him, now, it's a requirement that you have to see. He says, yes, I know, I can see. He says, well, I mean, don't just say that you see. <laughs> what, what can I do? When a person knows in his heart that he is a sinner and a holy God has died for him, that man leaves his sin. He does not say, what an opportunity to stay in my sin. That's like having the blind man saying, well, I could go around and pretend I can see by keeping my eyes closed and just telling people I can't see. Why would anyone do that? One who has never seen before and even say to himself, do I really want to open my eyes? I could say I can see and never open them. Boy, if I believed what you believed, I would say I could see and never open my eyes. That's the same question. I would get saved and live like the devil. Why, if I believed the gospel, I would just say I can see and never open my eyes. That's the same thing as saying I would never leave my sin if I saw the holy God die for me. It is part of the good news to be in the presence of the Holy God and to be saved from the power of sin. Now, this special union in Christ has to do with us understanding how Christ did it all. And it's easy to blame Adam and to say, he really did a number on us. He really did. And somehow, I don't remember any of it, and it makes me feel angry. And, you know, it's still the truth, isn't it? In Adam's fall, we've sinned all. And what I'm going to say tonight concerning how we must see that we died in Christ and we rose in Christ is part of this union. And that is why our salvation is sure. This is something that you do not feel. This is something you believe. Now, remember how I've said before that many times we, we seem to give up on, uh, shall we say, looking to doctrine because it doesn't make us feel anything and that we want to feel saved, we want to feel good, and, and the Pentecostals have, have kind of gotten the market on, you know, they can feel the Holy Spirit and many times uh, God's people are jealous of the idea that, well, I want to feel God too. You know, I, I want to feel this, and I want to feel like I'm saved. Well, I'm not against feeling like, I'm not against feeling saved. But you have to know first. You must get your feelings from what you know. Now this here, this is something you're never going to feel. Have you ever felt that you died in Adam? Do you ever feel that? Oh, God. I think I, I think I just felt a little death in Adam, right here. It hurt. I never felt that. And I never felt it here or here. I understood it to be true. That truth impacted my feelings. It did. It, it, it caused a great shadow to come over me. Oh my, have I, am I that lost? Am I that hopeless? But this is something that you know, that in Christ, these blessings come to us. No one, no one, no power can take this away. And so the overriding theme in chapters 1 through 8 is not just sanctification. I mean, <laughs> that was completely wrong. It's not just justification, but it is the assurance that justification by an imputed righteousness can never be defeated by anything and that we are safe in Christ. <clears throat> so I want you to take those two, two words, in 
Christ and always equate that with the worthiness of Christ to save you. His power, his worthiness. Now, since this chapter has traditionally been thought of as the beginning of Paul's doctrine in sanctification, many times uh, are, we have a misunderstanding of what that's all about. Like, for example, oh, I can't wait to get rid of this sinful flesh. This sinful flesh. Like, this flesh is sinful. And really what's on the inside is God has made it good, and I have to live with this sinful flesh. Well, that, there's a problem with that, folks, because the Lord Jesus Christ took upon the same flesh that we have. And he did pretty good with it. Pretty good. That's an understatement, folks. Okay? He took upon our flesh. Now, what was wrong with the flesh he took on? I'll, I'll ask the question another way. What's wrong with our flesh? Is it, well, for one thing, when we were in Adam, he sinned and we died. And from the time we were born, we started dying. Now, the words that are used to describe this situation in the Bible is called corruptible. This is corruptible flesh. Now, we tend to use that word corruptible like with politicians. They're corruptible. They're full of evil. They're, they're, they're deal makers with the devil and that type of thing. And we tend to use that word with the flesh. That means like there's something intrinsic evil about the flesh. It's dying. The flesh is dying because of Adam's sin. We are all dying. That is one reason how Christ saved us because he took upon himself the corruptible flesh so that he could die for us with us in him. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And we are in him and he paid the debt. He came to die. That flesh did not cause him to sin. He was the holy lamb of God. Now, you know what that to you takes away 99% of your excuses for the things you do because that flesh. It's like putting the, the, this, the, the body is a fantastic thing. Put it in the hands of a sinner and you get you <laughs> and me. <laughs> we tend to take good things, or shall we say, even though it's corruptible, even though it's dying, this flesh left to itself, let's just say that that God took me out of my flesh and put a good person in me. This flesh would not do those wrong things that I do. You know what makes my body do evil things? Me. You know what makes your body do evil things? You. There are things about our bodies that are really good. People used to think, oh, sex is evil. Sex is bad. No, it's people that abuse it. It's like eating. Some of us is like, eating can be a real problem with you. Just like anything else. Hoarding, greed, avarice, all types of sin that seem to be linked to the body, that, we, that, we, that, that doing these things, the body says, this is part of what I am. I like to eat, I like to travel, I like to do this, I like to do that. I like to do all types of things. My body and I are inseparable. I take it everywhere I go, and I like to feed it and pamper it and give it everything. However, the body isn't driving you to do it. It is the sinful nature. But we're not talking about that now, are we? This is what we're not talking about. You're not trying to kill the flesh. You're not, you're not trying to die to the flesh. You need to, you need to mortify the nature within you so that the flesh that you have can be fed and clothed and properly lived a righteous life in the sight of God that you may offer this body a living sacrifice to Him. And that's what we ought to do. If this body was intrinsically evil, well then that would mean that when our body died, our spirit would be released. Oh, it was so good to get out of that evil body. No. There's nothing wrong with that evil body. I mean, it's corruptible to be sure. And the ones we're going to get are much better. Much, much better. Got lot, lots, that, you know, it's got one of those really high mileage, you know, type of bodies. Okay? It's going to be really good. And the idea that Paul is teaching us here is that our safety is not in our hands. 
It is in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> that was like an introduction of what he's going to say and why he wanted to answer that question. So, the reason for the law coming in. Let me get back to the verses that we read, 20 and 21. I've said it many times, and many of you are repeating the answers in your head as I speak. Why was the law given? Well, the scriptures imply the answer here, that, that the sin might abound. How does the sin abound? Because it points it out. It's like shining a light in a dark room, and you say, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Now, the light did not create the sin. It points it out. But with human beings living in corruptible bodies that tend to say, I only got 70 years. I better hurry up and start sinning all I can because life is short. That's what sinful people do. They say, they call it a bucket list. <laughs> I want to do things before I die. I got to hurry up. I've got all these things to do before the clock runs out. Now, when the law comes, it points out all these things that we should say, did sin abound? Did, did the law actually make us sin? Well, the law doesn't make you sin, but when a sinner sees the law, sometimes it brings something to his mind that says, you know, I didn't think of that one. Only a sinner can be incited to sin by something holy. Leave it to us to take something good and make it bad. But even without the law, we're great sinners. But when the law comes, it's so, I didn't know I could do that. I've got to put that on my bucket list. And that happens all the time. All the time. And culture to culture to culture. God, here, God says, here is my light. Here is a lamp. Use it to, to, to display a path before your feet and walk in my ways. And yet when we have the light, we tend to use it to discover new ways of perversion. That is sinful man. That is what we are. But Paul said all that to say this. What you were in Adam has been superseded by what you are in Christ. And that what the law came to do, which is actually a schoolmaster to bring us to the, our knowledge of the need of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing in the law that we can do that will ever merit justification. You cannot undo your sin. You can only pay for it. It's not as though you said, oh, realizing that I'm wrong, that should be enough. No, realizing you're wrong should be enough for you to agree with the judge and say, you're right, I deserve condemnation. That's the only thing that you can tell the judge that's truthful. If you completely repented, you could only say, I deserve it. Nothing that you can do can undo what you've done. There's only one that can do that. When you're in him, he can die and rise again because he is sinless and he is righteous and we are in him and his righteousness is imputed the same way Adam's sin was imputed to us. It cannot be beaten. It is the unbeatable salvation. It cannot be defeated. Nothing about it is wanting or lacking. It's abounding over and above what sin has done within us and to us, and, and we are part of that problem, and he has saved us in him. So, verse number 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might the grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I like the word reign because that is a, I don't know if I want to call it a metaphor, but it brings an image to my mind that when Adam brought sin into the world and sin brought condemnation, this, uh, and condemnation brings death, this death reigned like a king in a domain. There is a relationship that we have with Adam and death reigns over us and we seem to have no, I don't know, I, I want to choose my words right and sometimes I have to pull them back, but we have no power to break the servitude that we have to sin 
which brings death, and therefore death reigns over us like a king, and we serve our own death. We serve it. We serve it because we are in love with our own sin. That's a real problem. Now, the idea of reigning in life, remember? Now that is in verse number 17 of chapter 5, where it says that, um, <clears throat> which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. And that means it used to be one in Adam, but now you're one in Christ by one Jesus Christ. And so reigning in life, that implies, that gives us another idea that there is a dominion and a king to whom we serve and there is a special relationship. We have now become children because we are in Christ. Christ is the only begotten Son of God and we being in Him are now, because of this union, and Paul is going to bring it in later on, I'm bringing it in now just to plant the seeds so that when we talk about it, you should say, oh, I remember he mentioned that in chapter 5 and chapter 6. This union with Christ. You have become His children. Now, the idea, let's go on. Now I'm going to read verses uh, 3 through, let's say, 14. Remember, he just asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, no, no. And he makes this statement, and, that's, and this one statement is what I've been talking about. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then he begins to explain that statement. And, and the explanation is this. We'll probably spend more time on this next week. But I'm going to read, and I want you the words to, to ring in your head. I'm starting in verse number 3 of chapter 6. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Now remember, I'm going to continue reading, but remember what I said about the old man, and remember what I said about these things. Think of Adam. Knowing this, that our old man, the one you were in, in Adam, <clears throat> is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, don't think that he is speaking only of the power of sin in your life, such as in sanctification. Okay? It's, it, it will include that. Sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit will be brought in to this doctrine. But right now, we are still dealing with the justifying work of Christ. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, and death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon. You know what that means, right? It doesn't mean, I want you to die to sin. No, no, no. I want you to believe and understand this. Reckon. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Believe it. This is not something you feel. This is not something you experience. This is something you understand and believe. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now that is a complete section right there. A complete section that deals with the idea that we have a union in Christ. Verses 15 through 23 
it's going to say the very same thing again from a different perspective because he asks the question again. We're going to cover this in a different message. In verse number 15, we say, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? See, that's another way of asking the same question in verse 1. It's another way. And he's going to come at it again. He repeats the same thing and has a different argument for it and helps us to understand. So that's a different message. Just be patient on that one, okay? We're going to go back to where we were. Now, with the section we just looked at, we're going to just take the bird's eye view of it tonight. And next week we're going to get more into details. We talked about, he brought, is he teaching about baptism? Is that what he's teaching about? No, he's the word we're baptized into Jesus. Am I going to have a lesson on baptism next week? No, I'm not. We're going to have a lesson on the justifying power of Christ. What it does to us. Okay? Now, because that's what it teaches. <laughs> that's what it teaches. So, here's the bird's eye view of it. <clears throat> Paul is saying this. Stop acting like babies. Now, that's my paraphrase. Okay? Now, you may say, well, I don't understand. What does that mean? How does that help me understand what this, what this is saying? He is saying, you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. You need to live like that. Now, if I would ever say to the people I work with at work, you know, you whine like a bunch of babies. Stop being babies. Now, why would that have an impact on them? Because they're full-grown men. They're not babies, are they? No, they're, they're men and, and, and women. And so I'm saying, you're not a baby. You're a man. Act like a man. Act like a woman. Stop acting like babies. Now, that's, now let me just say, the way, say it the way Paul said it. You're not alive to sin. You're dead to sin. Start acting like it. You are dead to sin. What, am, am I dead to sin? I just said you were in Christ and he died. You died in Christ to sin. You need to believe that. This is something you believe, not feel. This is doctrine that has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures for your edification and understanding. You have died to sin. I don't feel like I did to sin. Stop feeling then. Stop, stop thinking that you can feel that. The doctrine of original sin is something that you do. I feel the doctrine of original sin. No, no. It's just taught in the Bible. We sinned in Adam. We are made righteous in Jesus Christ. When he died... You were in him when he died to sin. You are dead to sin. That has to do with the dominion and the power of death over you. The power of death over you. Sin and death has no power. That means you're not going to die in your soul. Your soul will not die. There is no need to fear death. There is no need to fear death. Start living like death is power over you. You're out of that world. You're out of that dominion. Death is not your king. It does not reign over you. Christ in life reigns over us. We're not babies. Any, we're, we're not babies. We're men. We're not living under the power, or shall we say the way the writer of Hebrews said it, the fear of death making us slaves to it always in bondage to the fear of death. That's why people have bucket lists. They don't think that you're going to live any longer to do anything with that bucket. The bucket's going away. They want to fill it up and do it. If I don't get to see the Taj Mahal before I die, I'm going to see something much better than that, much greater than that, probably in distant galaxies. I, can do, I, don't, I don't need that. There's a lot of things I don't need in this life because... I'm not going to die. This flesh will fall. This is corruptible flesh. That's a given. And the more I live in it, you know, good riddance. Good riddance to this body. But until then, I'm going to make the best of it that I can. I'm not going to allow it to tempt me to do things I shouldn't do and to serve my flesh in a way that the world serves their flesh, but to use my body 
for the glory of Christ. To put it under subjection. To beat it if I have to. Not that I should. <laughs> Sometimes you look in the mirror and you slap yourself in the face. Why? Just because you need it, right? Not physically, but spiritually. You need to say, shape up. Shape up. We need to see that we are in a different realm. Now that means that we have our own king. We are his subjects. We are in Christ. That power. Now when I say that power, it is the power of truth to enable you to live in this sinful world the way you ought to live. You need to shape up, walk like Christians. Why? Because you used to be in Adam, now you're in Christ. Sin, which produces death, does not have that power over you anymore. Is death ever going to conquer Christ? No. You are in Christ. That's supposed to be good news, folks. Anything that Christ has done for you is yours. He sits on the right hand of God. We are in Christ. He has defeated death. We are in Christ. He lived his life for our sakes. We are in him. Everything that Adam did to you, forget about it. Everything that Christ did for you, embrace it. Why should you live to sin that are dead to sin? You're dead to it. You don't have to feel it. You just have to understand it and know it. When you understand it and know it, knowing the truth will produce its own feelings. I feel good about it. I feel good about knowing that I am dead to sin. And what's that mean? Death has no power over me. The more I think about it, the richer my life becomes. The more I think about death having no power over me, it's like, I don't even need a bucket list now. I just got a bucket. And I just keep filling it up. It has no bottom. I can do anything. I can do all these things. I can endure in this short life anything that he wants me to endure. I can do this because Christ, I am in him. And he is with me. He is in us. We are in him. Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we in Christ, the recipients of all his grace, the abounding grace that much more abounds over all the things that had power over us and authority over us and dominion over us. Those things fade away. They're gone. We are dead to them because Christ died for us. The only reason he put on this corruptible flesh is that we may be in him, in him, when he died and rose again. All these things for us. He did them for us. He died for our sins. This is the way that he did it. It's explained to us. It's just, it just says it here. All we do is read it, are blessed by it, and live by the strength of our knowledge that this is the truth. Not the strength of your feelings when you get into a meeting and everybody gets to jump around and feel good. What is that all about? We need to jump around inside ourselves because of the truth. The truth shall set us free. And this is what we're, we'll look at in more detail next week, verses 3 through 14, which is basically the details of how he's going to explain it. And I kind of gave you the bird's eye view tonight, so that when you come next week, maybe you'll say, oh, I, I think I heard him say that in a different way last week. Okay? And it works like this. Don't be babies. Well, because you know you're not babies, right? Don't be dead. I mean, you know, don't live to sin. You should know that you have died to sin. I'm going to read it one more time and we're done. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's a good question, is it not? Especially if you know you, have, you, you are dead to sin. Why? Because we are in Christ. He just taught that in chapter 5. I just want to 
did you listen at all? You know, it's like the Apostle Paul says, I have to repeat this so many times. And every time we tend to study the book of Romans by saying, I'm going to start in chapter 6. And boom, 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 and you start reading it and saying, I guess I'm going to have to die to sin. No, 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 no. You should have, went, you should have read chapter 5. He died for you. He died for you. And you were in him. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your...